welcome to Farm Vlog. And today I'm talking to Nico Villarreal uh, about, let's just call it the haze of Bidenomics. I don't really know what to call it. We're going to be dealing with profit rates, uh, current trends and and left economics from the likes of MMT and Seth Ackerman, the Petit Bourgeoisie, all kinds of stuff are coming up today. So, um, and I'm going to, of course, link the articles we refer to by Nico in the show notes, obviously. So, uh, how are you doing today? I'm doing all right. Um, I've been, uh, uh, stressed lately but finally got some chance to relax i've uh, had a i guess a flurry of work that i did um when i uh, wrote those last two articles um I, economics is one of those things where um it really seizes my attention and i uh have to get whatever idea is out of me before i uh like lose it you know yeah well, and also, it, it's something that I think the information can be difficult to parse in real time. So you kind of have to act very quickly um, sure. when you get data. And I find the current data problems kind of interesting. Um, you know, I well, it's funny because, like, certainly there's lots of data points that I'm thinking about recently. Like I, I try to keep up to date with everything that comes out, especially with the uh, GDP national account stuff as that comes out. But a lot of the things that I've been obsessing with recently have kind of been slow burning um, that I've been thinking about a long time. And only recently has something happened where it made me realize something. So there was um, like the, you call the stream like a haze of economics under Biden. There's one like particular thing. Uh, I, mean, I mean, there's lots of particular things with Biden uh, and the, like in the economy and how that's being affected. But um, the thing that I had been thinking about the longest was uh, the relationship of like uh, antitrust um, and class politics and how that's being uh like picked up by the Biden administration because it like I recognized that it was like back in 2019 or so that this was a thing that was becoming um, like that that the Trump administration had really brought to the fore and then the Democrats who had not really been doing anything on it kind of started picking up on it too and this was stronger for like the the social Democrat wing of like the the Bernie crap wing of the Democratic Party but now it was like a mainstream thing because uh, Biden was talking about it it's during his transition, right? Um, and now we're seeing everything that he's doing about it. Um, it made me realize that this is like a very firm bipartisan consensus. And what and I had this thought, like when, when I was thinking about this originally, that the tech companies would really try to do something about this, that they wouldn't just stand by and let it happen. Um, and they really haven't done anything out of the ordinary to prevent it. Um, like the, uh, they have that there's, I mean, the antitrust suit going, uh, against Amazon and that, and lots of other things are being considered as well. Um, but the idea that it would get this far it, and the tech companies just wouldn't do anything about it was like, uh, I, I, I didn't think that was how it was going to play out, um. Yeah, I've been thinking a lot about uh, I've been thinking a lot about this antitrust stuff too because for for like literally two decades we've kind of ignored antitrust law <laughs> like yeah. just entirely. Um, now there is a, a broad bipartisan consensus on actually doing something about it. I completely agree with you on that. And what makes that more interesting is that it's actually part of a large panoply of things that there's a kind of hidden bipartisan consensus on. And I say hidden 
because it seems like neither side wants to admit how much continuity there is on economic policy between the two parties right now. Um, you'll get lip service in opposition to either on the uh, on the Democratic side to something like a more social democratic, you know, whatever this post neoliberalism is. And you'll get lip service on the Republican side to like a freer market or to the you know, the Liberty Caucus, but they, they largely actually have come to consensus on infrastructure. They've come to a consensus on not that they can do it, but they, they mm-hmm. come to a consensus about its need. Um, they've come to a consensus on antitrust law. They've come to a consensus on reassuring. They've come to a consensus on limiting immigration and not using that as a way to lower certain kinds of of wage sectors anymore i mean the craziest thing about all this is that where where this came from because trump was the one who was the leader on all these things um and like the fact that he was the one who was moving policy on this and now that these are all things that are bog standard in washington the trump like the trump tax policy the trump (laughs) trade policy um the trump infrastructure and all like the the first really big insane spending package happened during the pandemic under Trump before Biden got into power. And actually, arguably, even though there's tons that we could talk about, it's mishandling the PPP loans, et cetera. Yeah. Um, the first spending bills in some way were more progressive because they are what enabled uh, the most progressive part of this of of the bailouts, which was expanding unemployment the way it was expanded. Yeah. Like which 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 when paired with a Biden change of uh, of raising the federal minimum, the federal minimum wage for federal contractors and employees, not, you know, legislatively for the general public really did set pace for a low end uh, wage increase. So when I say low end, I mean, like, you know, entry level workers have seen pretty significant wage increases in a lot of fields. What's interesting about that though, is it doesn't go up very far. Like, so you've seen a lot of increase of base pay, but like mid tier pay has actually been somewhat consistent. It's going up, but like far less, far less pegged to inflation. Um, Then we had the great AI job apocalypse, which I'm not saying won't happen, but it's not happening as fast as we, feared um the technology seems to have been underutilized or not utilized well in its rollout by these tech companies and in fact i've been surprised in general about two things one is the amount of consensus that's hidden and everyone's like oh we're super divided and i'm like it seems like the division's actually distracting from what the consensus is in some ways yeah. The, no, it, like, go ahead. I, I think the important thing about this, it, like what, at least the way that I've understood it, is that what really drove these changes is the militancy of the petty bourgeois in response to um, like a resurgent monopoly power and in general, like the trends of globalization, uh, which was simmering a long time, but really took shape under Trump. Like Trump gave all of this coherency and like like the an ideology um and like he he was doing like the the work of uh of uh, um of creating uh ideology and putting it into the state apparatus um of this group the uh and i actually for the a long time i i didn't have too much spe- specifics on um like the the uh, data on um, how the economy has shifted between like small and large firms. Um, mm-hmm. I finally got some of like that data uh, from the census um, and uh, like looking at how uh, employment by firm size has shifted over the years since like um, 1978 or something, which was kind of a, a tease because it, it would have been really helpful to know what had uh, what it looked like just like 10 years before that. Um, to see how the '70s really transformed um, the, the the economy, but the big takeaway—I mean, these numbers don't actually shift all that much because you're just looking at employment, not like the um, income and so on. It's going to these different firms, but 
the the clear trend that you see is that the the small and medium sized businesses were really ascendant up until like the early to mid 2000s um and then like the biggest firms 1000 more employees are start to take off uh like like return back to their highs at the uh, very start of this process um and i think that this really is what kicked off this whole like the political situation that we have now um and why uh like the why this became the the bipartisan consensus right now um well i find your i find your focus on the petite bourgeoisie interesting because the left right now the left uh whatever the fuck that is i'm i'm just gonna start always using the left in scare quotes because i don't know what it means anymore and if i don't know what it means neither do most people but um but there's been a movement around a certain coterie of not quite post left third generation post left actually to be clear because that's mean different things in time too i hate the way these words get recycled <laughs> dumbly but um not quite post left but almost you know social democrat adjacent um like quasi workerism that's emerged out of people like Catherine Liu yeah. um class unity caucus etc um that i have increasingly seen as like totally stuck on the idea of the pmc a class that i don't even think is a class mm -hmm. like um and people attack me because they're like well the pmc elites run everything but when you ask them who it is there's always a game with who they're referring to um whereas it seems to me that there's two things going on uh, and i do think Kristen parenti of all people actually did kind of hit this nail on the head and i used it in your article on on the petit bourgeoisie which uh for people listening are watching will be in the show notes um i started seeing that maybe michael lind had a point and, and this is not me endorsing lind's politics which are totally corporatist um in the old sense of that word but that it really did seem like there's a strata of former petite bourgeois who are now professionalized so they are we we could call them labor aristocrats because they have they have government employees highly unionized jobs uh um they're carteled uh they have licensure and then you have a very active petite bourgeois, right? And Lynn says right now, um, I think he said this since the new class war, that if you want to understand American politics, you have to understand the divisions between these, these two groups. I think that's broadly speaking true with the concession that the PMC is a more confused category, which contains many petite bourgeois elements in it itself. Mm -hmm. And because of that there's a there's a mystification on its on like the identity politics and culture war stuff around this group as a means of getting ahead in you know very limited you know uh white collar kind of work um at the same time these same people are often doing what the right wing does and actually valorizing elements of the petite bourgeoisie um as the working class without it without even acknowledging radical differences in 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 the interest of these groups and then also not dealing with on top of that an, a kind of lumpenization of a whole a whole swath of the U S working class in deindustrialization. So mm -hmm. I don't mean they're true lump in, and that, you know, in the Marxist sense that they're like criminalized. I mean that people are in gig work and have to like work in precarious jobs that are highly alienated and isolated from each other and actually kind of have to be, they're often going and the same person will be a petite bourgeois part of the day and then be a wage earner a part of the day and may even be partaking in the gray economy for part of the day um 
making like clear class interest in organization much harder to do. And I think you even see that in the kinds of organizational attempts the left tends to do right now. They're not trying to, even though we have a uh, union militancy, I think today I read there's more strikes going on right now than there has been in American history. Asterisk, not when you adjust for population size though, on asterisk, but still like there's real labor militancy right now, even if unions somehow aren't growing. Um, and that leads me to a, a kind of question then if, if the, like, let me, let me put it this way. Um, the semi petite bourgeoisification of large parts of the economy are actually really interesting. So I'm just going to speak about a field I know a lot about my family, uh, has been tied into auto dealerships in, in the mechanic sector for a long time. They can't get parts. They can't sell cars. And so a lot of the workers in downstream of the UAW right now are turning against the UAW. Mm -hmm. um, be, but part of the problem there is that they are piecemeal commission workers who also have a semi petite bourgeois, like the way they have to bill hours puts them in a semi petite bourgeois position. So even in these, these cases where these people by any Marxist definition are workers, but the structure of their work incentivizes them to act like petite bourgeoisie. And there's tons of them downstream of industrial workers. And there's more of them than there are the industrial workers. And so it's very hard to see how you generate a clear class politics out of that as a revolutionary subject. So your article thesis on the petite bourgeoisie as a revolutionary class and how this generated a consensus in response to it first under Trump. But the remarkable thing is that a lot of the more democratic party adjacent left has not really addressed is how fucking consistent. And people, policy... yeah, go people ahead. don't realize that, the, like the petty bourgeois, small business owners, these people, while they prefer the Republicans, it's not overwhelming. It's like 60, 40 or something like that. Maybe not even that far. Um, it's, there's a lot of petty bourgeois people in the Democratic Party. Um, and But I think to hit on something deeper there is that there's this tendency, like I kind of used uh, the like revolutionary class there uh, you could kind of put that in quotation marks, um, like that. But there, yeah, I, I think the, you were actually kind of implying they were a counter-revolutionary class. But well, it's, but yeah, here's the ahead. thing: is that um, there's a lot of people, like the like the post-left people that you're pointing out. There's also like the uh, the, the patriotic socialist types, the, the um, like uh, has and a lot of other people, Caleb Maupin, mm -hmm. um, who basically pick up on this thing that the petty bourgeois is the class that is like the biggest problem right now for the state um, that has yet to be solved, which is how I frame it in the article, that, it, that is, there's a real thing that the people aren't imagining when talking about like, oh, like the, like January 6th or the trucker protests or the anti-lockdown people or whatever, um, like that, that that's like these people actually are like anti uh, like, like are a problem for the state they, they are um like that so i see why people look to them as a revolutionary subject um but the the problem with that is um like is this the classical problems of of um that marxists have always talked about with the, with the petty board and i've talked about it a lot is that it's a like you can go back to um, like the uh, 18th Brumaire um, and Marx is talking about like the, um, well, he, he talks about the French peasants. He like, at this point, like the petty bourgeois are still like supporting democratic struggle or whatever. They're basically like the um, like centrist libs in parliament or whatever are the uh, like this, like, like the less radical Republicans are basically what they're associated with at the time. But the way that Marx describes the um, uh, the peasants 
is something that I think perfectly describes um, like the, the petty bourgeois in America today and lots of parts in the world, which is that they, these people are atomized. They have like their little parcel that they own um, and they do their work kind of uh, on their own. They're not like in common, they're not in cooperation with society or at large. And they are, um, they need strong leaders to, because they don't have like their own kind of collective politics. They, they look towards like Bonaparte in that situation. And, and that's another reason I think that Trump is a very Bonapartist figure is that he is this like strong leader for an atomized, um, isolated, uh, like petty bourgeois class that has these analogs to the fr French peasantry at the time. Um, the, like the, they they can't create a better society. It's like as is like trying to um, because they can't like like one they can't they can't imagine anything beyond. They're trying to preserve bourgeois with social relations really really hard, but they're they are the weakest link of like bourgeois society at the same time because of their economic situation. Let's talk about that for a second, because there is also a left response to this. I think, you know, came out of uh, Seth Ackerman's reply to Dylan Riley and Robert Brenner. Now, I have my my uh, critiques of the Brenner and Riley thesis on Biden, one of which is they point out that most of what Biden done, has done is a response to Trump. And then they point out that correctly that Trump can't totally claim what he did because he had to keep, you know, neoliberal elements of his coalition in the coalition. But then they somehow read Biden as way a, a new force of politics um, and as a holder of neo-progressivism, uh, whatever that means, which I think is silly. But one of the things that they do talk about, I don't love their idea of political capitalism because capitalism has always been political it, it's, it's yeah. that's confused but the thing they point out is it seems like we're attempting keynesian management strategies on a low profit economy um and the marx uh, the uh not the marxist well actually i guess ackerman would consider himself a marxist even though he doesn't talk like one um but the modern monetary theorists and people and a lot of the social Democrats like South Ackerman have been arguing that, no, the economy is doing really well. I mean, Freddie DeBoer came on my show and said he didn't understand why, you know, uh, people felt like the economy was doing poorly under Biden. And and I was I kept my mouth shut, but I was like, I can tell your Substack's doing well. Um <laughs> Uh, because yes, GDP is about 3% and that's historically high-ish, but when you look at, when you look at the finer details of that, it paints a much more stagnant picture and, um, you picked up on this and, and we'll tie, I think I want to tie this back into your thesis is about the petty bourgeoisie and, you know, my observations about lumpenization, but you do tie this back into two things. One You've looked at what's holding the banks solvent right now, and it's mm -hmm. not what people think. And two, um, even though we haven't gone back to QE, so this is working in a different way, but but there is a way in which, you know, the Fed looks like it's just plummeting <laughs> actually right now. Um, furthermore, uh the the actual profit rate it, I, I will admit i become skeptical that we actually completely i've I, i've almost taken a palmatic junior view of it where like some of these things are hard to measure the way we measure them and thus it's very hard to talk about um but we do have proximity measures and it mm -hmm. seems to me that using just net gdp even though and in the long durée, that also indicates that there's a decline in the rates of profits because net GDP is kind of since the 60s been between what three, like one and five percent, like pretty much perpetually. <laughs> um, but 
it also seems to me that when you look at these other indicators, you start seeing that profits are not what they seem. And um, particularly when you start dealing in real commodities. Uh, and it's not just de-dollarization or whatever that is driving this. So would you like to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so I, I think that the... Well, I, I think that the statistics on rate of profits are pretty good. That we like that. Oh, I mean, I I reduce it to like a, um, to basically a, a different way of looking at the profit margin. Just don't worry about the capital stock, which Acumen was really focused on. Um, but even like I, I've also done some double checking on this. Of, like when you use depreciation instead of the capital stock, and you use you just using flow measures it will mirror the like same trajectory of a of what the capital stock is doing generally um well can the, you explain what that means to listeners who might not understand you so like the um so when you invest in uh, like uh, fixed capital um you have these things that are now on your balance sheet um uh, that uh, uh you have that you don't immediately count the cost of these things that you um, you bought as like an ex as a business expense, um, they're investments, and they slowly get moved as expenses through depreciation, taking them off the balance sheet and onto your income statement as an expense. Um, so the uh, so the capital stock is this um, asset of like the fixed machinery, the fixed um, like the machinery equipment, all, all the kind of stuff that. Um, you need for the business um, and depreciation is how that much that's used up. Um, specifically, Marx talks about how the the amount that's used up, it has its value represented in uh, the price of the, or the value of the um, uh, final commodity. Um, and that's, so it, when you look at income, you can divide it into like depreciation, wages, um, the surplus, uh, which is what, um, which is reflected in actual national accounts, but uh, like there's a more Marxist way of looking at it. Um, I haven't even touched like turnover rates and stuff like that, uh, but I'm hoping to look more into that into the future. Um, the thing that, like the so the the thing that uh, Ackerman was really like the, the technical critique he made of all these people saying that like the um, capital stock. Uh, measures like the depreciation rates were incorrect was, was what he said and this meant that capital stocks were different um, and creating like a rate of profit that doesn't show like a, a tendency for profit rates to fall um, but that's just not like his, his, the way he did it um, he basically did like the um, took the wrong data of like so I actually looked back and I realized that if you, there was a correct set of data he could have used from the paper he cited um, what, because basically it's just, they took a new depreciation rate and applied it to this capital stock, um, and caused it to change drastically because it was a just, because the whole time that capital stock was created, it was up working under a different depreciation rate. So by introducing a new one, it had to rapidly change to adjust to that new outflow level. Whereas if you had applied that depreciation rate consistently for the whole time period that like you have how we're tracking investment and had this um, uh, capital stock, which the paper also does, it like applies this depreciation rate going back to 1901. Um, then you get a totally different um, uh, capital stock that is like more in line. Like you would get a measure that is very similar to other profit rate measures um, in terms of the, the shape that it takes, even if it's at a different level. Um, so, right. so to explain why this is important, it means that the contention that Seth Ackerman and a lot of modern monetary theorists, not all, but a lot, mm -hmm. uh, put out that by basically increasing liquidity through fiscal policy, you can stimulate enough production to offset any tendency of the rate of profit to fall. So um, fundamentally... Like the, there's a couple big problems with that. Is mm -hmm. that the um, like first of first of all, you have to keep in mind that the Keynesian policy framework is what created 
like the big profitability crisis of the 70s. There's, Absolutely. That should, <laughs> yes. that, should, that should not be in contention. When you have, um, and like the, the point of the economic stimulus is like you, like, like you're having rising wages. If you have rising wages, rising investment, um, as particularly as a share of the economy, um, eventually you're going to run into a profitability crisis. That is, it's just what's going to happen. Um, because the more investment that you have, the more capital stock, the more depreciation, uh, and the more wages, obviously the less profit you're going to have. Um, the, the idea of, like you, you can stimulate the economy to induce, um, tighter labor markets, like, like through full employment, um, or if just full employment is your goal, you're still going to get tighter labor markets. Um, the, like the, the whole thing that like, I, I, I am very open to all the kinds of possibilities here. Like I, I am even open to the possibility that what Biden's doing right now lays the foundation for a systemically higher wage growth and higher investment type of economy. The problem with that happening, which it, I think it's like, it's a good problem to have. That it's the kind of problem that we as Marxists want is that you're going to get to another profitability crisis because of those that, that policy because of that systemic framework. Um, and the problem that Ackerman and people like him have because is that they don't recognize that they are fundamentally because they're like um, they're wedded to like the uh, basically to capitalism. They're like Seth Ackerman. I actually liked him as I was becoming like familiar with socialism. Uh, he was a mark. Like he had this article um basically elaborating like a system of market socialism um, that I thought was really interesting and kind of, uh, it, it, I enjoyed it. Um, but if you take that as your end goal um, and you like, you can't accept um, these, like, I mean, it's different once if you've actually eliminated the capitalist class, but the problem of what he's talking about right now is if you have a capitalist class, once you hit that limit, you're going to have to expropriate them in order to keep the gains that you have in terms of the the income of society going to workers and to the means of production and so on. If you don't do that, you're going to get exactly what, what happened in the 70s and the 80s, which was the rise of neoliberalism, that you had to um, like uh, do all these things to... to take down workers' income, um, decrease investment rates. Um, the And the thing is, is that because of what we did then, be, this is all connected back to the petty bourgeois, um, because like one of the strategies of how to deal with this, um, this was very explicit um, in how like uh, the capitalism in the 70s and 80s worked, was that um, you took businesses and you cut off the unprofitable parts and had those be their own business so that like the big capitalists could preserve their profitability. And this created a whole new class of like, um, like the petty bourgeois uh, regional capitalists. Cause really like the, what we're talking about petty bourgeois, the, the leading elements of this are not people who have a small operation of like two or three employees. That's actually been a decreasing part of the economy. Yeah, that would yeah. be. We might even call that the petty petty bourgeois at this point. Yeah, like and, on, and honestly, like I can respect like that. There's like some um, something emancipatory in just this very like one one or two people or just a small group of people who are trying to just make a living for themselves, right? Um, that like the, the, there's something dynamic about that or whatever. Artisan consciousness. Like and and art artisan consciousness and it yes. and, and it is proletarianizing in a way because like their profits suck. Um, yeah. um, but the know, thing they is, must ask to get them. So, mm -hmm. but the thing is, is like what really we're talking about as a political and economic phenomenon are like people who have like 10, 20 up to even like a hundred employees, um, maybe even more on like a regional level, uh, like. There's all well, these different arrangements of like franchises are really big and stuff. But the point is, is that the a lot of what like why these things became a thing is because they were the unprofitable parts of these bigger businesses. Um, and like uh, and what you were talking about earlier, like these like the that uh, the reason that um, uh, that like 
car dealerships do that kind of thing of like the, treating these people almost as like um, their own businesses, like as like almost as contractors or whatever, having their piecemeal and whatever. Um, that's because like they don't want to take on the risk of those like uh, of shifts in demand and whatever. They want to pass on as much of like the the business risk uh, to other people as they can. Um, and when you've done that, and when you've atomized uh, production in general, um, like it makes society more vulnerable to uh, profitability crises. So it took like the whole post-war period to get to the profitability crisis of the 70s. It would not take as long to, if we were to take that route again. Um, it would happen much quicker and it would, and because the, the petty bourgeois is a militant political faction society now that has real power in setting the agenda in Washington, um, it would be a much bigger problem uh, because now like these people are facing like an economic, um, an existential economic problem and they have political power to do something about it. And right. we, okay. we really didn't see what would like during the pandemic, we had PPE loans and all that stuff to make sure that didn't happen to ameliorate over all of these like things. We don't, we still don't know exactly what that would look like in the post 2008 period. Well, I think there's a, there's a bunch of black boxes opening up. Uh, there's the return of financial, of all the capital tied into student loans which admittedly doesn't affect all of society, but it does affect like 40% of it or something. It's, 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 it's significant. Um, there is the fact that things like PP, uh, PPP loans and that sort of stuff has dried up. Other forms of investment has dried up. Local in, uh, investments, which have been able to kind of hoist stuff up through federal block grants and stuff that had came through COVID is drying up. So, and all the programs that we were, sold by Democrats in 2020 that were going to be, they were going to try to long term, they achieved almost none of that. A few of those things did get put into the the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, inflation has more or less seemingly stabilized for now. I don't know how long that's going to stay. Um, I, mean, I think it's entirely possible we shift into deflation sooner rather than later. Um, the way that like uh, I mean, the thing that funny thing that happened is that, like, uh, you you remember everybody talking about the bullwhip effect, right? Mm -hmm. uh, in the supply chain crisis. Well, now we're at the very very end of that. That the lesson that um, everybody learned was so like, well, not really a lesson, but what ended up happening is that everybody now that like the the supply chain kinks are gone has a lot more inventory than they did before, than before the crisis. And this like more inventory, like that, that has to like be absorbed somehow, you know, um, this you have to absorb the cost of maintaining the inventory. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think, and there's still areas where, the, where that's breaking down. See what I was talking about with cars, but it's, the idea that we're going to return back to like, we might see deflation. We might not what or what we might see is radical sect is actually sectional decoupling. So you might see like inflation in certain key commodities like food mm -hmm. and radical deflation and other things. I like, for example, I don't know how the car industry is going to maintain itself if it's prices stay at it is, and it's only building luxury cars. Like, I don't think there is a demand to keep uh, a whole lot of this, that industry open mm -hmm. um, with the, with that kind of pricing model, like, and an unwillingness to, you know, manufacture economy still probably 35 to $40,000 um, cars um, because the profit margins on those cars are so low. And this is what I keep pushing back on with the, like, when I look at this piecemeal, when I look at actual individual, like, commodities, I'm like, most physical commodities have lower and lower returns. And, and we'll get to this because this is going to get complicated. The whole rentier economy that venture capital was maintaining where people were leveraging 
profits off of death off of debts as a way of avoiding taxes if you know actually i don't think people realize that's what it does like if you can if you can eke out just enough profit to to be to uh, outpace your debt you can also hide your your earnings by taking on additional debt mm -hmm. um which these rentier companies were clearly doing and that led to you know the theories everybody was talking about three years ago and somehow some leftists are still pretending that they're like neo-feudalism or whatever um which to me is laughable after you know 2022 to be maintaining that thesis um but when I when I look at all this right now, I, I have to put an asterisk on all of it because this stuff with the petite bourgeois seems to me volatile as fuck and highly unpredictable. Mm -hmm. um, because one one thing that we can say about the professional end of the petite bourgeoisie, what we might call the PMC or I, I like to call the PMS, the professional managerial strata. Um, is that there's a real sense that government largesse is holding those people up through government contracts, through, through indirect investment, et cetera. And there's a real sense that also, despite the fact that like the GOP likes to poke at those people, they really don't actually want to damage that infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Like, um, so you have that political base, but a lot of those institutions, frankly, are becoming less and less relevant. For example, higher education, which I don't think we're going to do away with, but it's going to be a smaller and smaller portion of our economy. Like, I think that's kind of undeniable at this point. Like the, the yeah, I mean, we've already seen the peak of college like graduates and stuff, and I, mean, I but to go back to what you were saying about like the like how volatile it is. Mm -hmm. um, one thing to keep in mind, like there was, uh, like I first saw this paper a few years ago about uh, profit rate distributions, um, and it was looking at. Like for, for most companies, private companies, we have no idea. Um, but for public companies, we do know. And it's there's some databases of uh, public company data uh, that go back to like, I don't know, the 60s or something. And um, if you plot the distribution of profit rates for uh, all the public companies uh, and you look at it over the years, how that distribution's changed, you can see that um, the, like it, the tail end, the negative, the, the side that is on the lower, the lower half of the profit rate distribution is for public companies. It's basically a triangle of uh, a logarithmic triangle. Um, it keeps going lower and lower and lower. So you have like the, and there was, a, it came back, like this came back to relevancy just a few weeks ago when Goldman Sachs put out a graph that showed this, like, what is the share of, negatively profitable public companies over time and it's you see it it's since the 60s it's been and it's particularly since like the 70s it's been going up and up and up and right now it's at like 50 percent 50 percent of all public companies are not profitable that's a crazy statistic um and if you think about that in terms of like the, the like the Here's the thing with like the rentierism kind of thing, right? Um, is that it's always like a double-edged sword, uh, and it's it, and it's a delicate thing too, because it was always kind of dependent on profit rates, or not profit rates, but on uh, interest rates. Yeah. Um, that because who can be the rentier is entirely dependent on the interest rates, because if if it's um, low then it's exactly what you're talking about the um the debtor gets to be the the rentier it's all of these companies that with negative profit rates and so on that are um uh like uh living off of 
um, these new uh, dollars created by credit um, who are um, like living off of like the irrational excesses of, of capitalism and speculation and so on. But as soon as profit rates go up, and it's like it's right now, and we haven't even really seen like the other foot, like the other shoe fall, um, because people, because interest rates are so high, are choosing not to get more debt. Um, they're trying to avoid it as much as possible. They're trying to lock in the low interest rates they had before. But eventually, that's not going to be feasible anymore. Um, and it's why we're seeing like, oh, Google, like YouTube is uh, forcing people to get off their ad blockers and stuff. It's why, um, well, I mean, the thing with Twitter is that like Musk made a horrible business decision in buying at such a high price, but it's the same kind of logic is that he needs to get like more operating income in order to make this work with the, the debt that he has. Um, the, the, the rentier shifts from the creditor or from the debtor to the creditor when you have the higher interest rates go up. Um, and it's, that's why it's like such a delicate thing and why it's like the, um, these distributional effects are really important for capitalist economies because it shifts um, where the excess is and where like the resources are going. This this is, is actually really crucial because I think that's going to change a lot of politics. Um, if these rentier companies are also thus drying up, and I think we've seen like. For me, when when Ackerman and Co. try to convince me that there's no declining rates of profits, and I'm like, well, okay, why is mass media failing? Why are we reaching all these profitability things in in areas of excess? Uh, why is it not just? Why is it happening in places outside of the United States? If it's just a currency policy problem, why do we see similar trends happening? In China, in Russia, I mean, the ruble fell through the floor this year. Mm -hmm. Like, and most people didn't notice it. Um, it's actually quite interesting reading uh, economic analysis right now on both the right and the left, because it's usually like a year and a half out of date, what they're saying is going on right now. Mm -hmm. um, and I admit, yes. There is something very frustrating to the constant predictions of the final crisis the next day. And like you and I both are, 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 are hesitant to do that. Um, for one, countervailing tendencies emerge all over the place in ways we don't see. That's how neoliberalism happened in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, that's how actually that's also how Keynesianism became viable. Um, and there's always a prediction to declare in the midst of that, that that all these trends are done that like um you know monopoly capital exists we don't have to worry about the crime rate for profit anymore 1950s 1960s mm -hmm. uh neoliberalism exists we don't like we we can immiserate and austerity our way out of the decline rates of profit somehow that prevents revolutionary subjectivity i don't know how but but that was the argument now i don't you know neo-feudalism or political capitalism or whatever is forestalling it or the idea that just monetary flows can handle the problem mm -hmm. and then you'll hear you know predictions of like well de-dollarization is happening tomorrow you know i think michael hudson has literally said this every month for two years now um and while there has been significant de-dollarization just because of the value of the dollar going up um it hasn't really led to like the weakness of the U S trade capacity at all. Yeah. Um, you know, this so, is, go ahead. this has been what my uh, instincts have been for this. Like ever since I kind of started thinking about econ economics and socialist politics and stuff, when I was like a bushy tailed um, undergrad, uh, I was, I, I came up with this idea that wrote this really terrible paper Um uh, based off of it for a class about how there are these trade-offs in capitalist regulation of economies um, that like it's like you you keep coming up with these new solutions but they create uh, but you and they create new problems but you can't ever escape these fundamental trade-offs and how you deal with the capitalist economy and I still think that's true um, I think that 
like and I mentioned this when we had our discussion on like the right after the bank started failing and, and the Silicon Valley Bank and stuff. Like there, were, like there were serious problems, but the overall, um, like I, I, I didn't think it was going to cause like, a cascading failure necessarily. Um, and uh, like even today, the the economic outlook is still very mixed. I don't see like oh the Great Depression two happening right around the corner. Uh, although certainly there are such, like things that could trip things up uh, somehow. Like um, auto loans are a big example. Um, Auto loans, commercial real estate. There's a lot yeah. of people up. There's, right yeah, now. there's there's big problems in the economy. Um, I don't know if there's like if they'll cause things to explode or not necessarily. But what I do know for a fact is that there are like even if like the next recession isn't like a final crisis of capitalism, I do believe final crises of capitalism exist. We saw one in the '70s, and what they are is the, the crisis of profitability. That. Um, that eventually this is what it this is what pushing up against the limits of these trade-offs actually looks like if you're interested in like the welfare of society um because event because once you hit that point and this is what makes the keynesians so irresponsible in my opinion is that the, is that by thinking that you can always just um regulate out of like the these problems um to just always have more prosperity and so on um, no, at some point you run into the this this comes into um, conflict with the reproduction of the capitalist class, and that's what we saw. And nobody, like none of the Keynesians and Ackerman, aren't talking about this. They never they never admit it. When I confront them about it, they don't even address it because it's not like that. This is not even like in the realm of things to talk about in economics, you know. Yeah, well, th this is something I brought up to MMTers where I'm like, okay, wh what if you're correct? What if everything you're saying is true? And yet, there is no way in which the power relationships th of the policy you want would be maintainable if we had full employment, for example. Yes, all Marxists should advocate for full employment because we know damn well. I mean, Marx said be careful about that. Be careful about promising it because we know damn well that under the capital that would be a disaster for for mm -hmm. for the capitalist. It would be like it would. Yeah. Uh, having no elasticity in the labor market would effectively, you know, tip the bargaining power to labor to a point that it could totally dip into the profitability. There's no way around that. I mean, um, and there's and there's knockoff effects that too. I mean, one of the reasons the national workshops were so important in like the the Second French Republic for the socialists is because they were like stimulated worker organizing extraordinarily. Um, and so does having full employment. Like you, you actually have all these people working cooperations and they have tight labor markets. You can't, but. The, well, like that's actually, why we are seeing so many strikes right now. Let's be honest. Yeah. It's because, because they can like, there's, there's less scabs to scab on you right now. Yeah, exactly. Um, but I, I saw this, um, this paper that was, uh, I, I don't think it was very intellectually deep, but it was one of those papers that's like trying to summarize and combine a bunch of different ideas and so on. Basically trying to combine um, uh, uh, degrowth and MMT to get like just climate transition or whatever, right? Uh, you mean, so someone like Jason Hinkle? Maybe. Um, that sounds I, like his deal. Go ahead. That just sounds like his deal. I can't remember who the author was. That might have been it. Um, but the, the it was just so pie in the sky, like just wishful thinking because they're like, oh, well, if we institute price controls and when we do the uh, the uh, stimulative spending, um, we can control the um, like the inflation is like whether is a that could result from this, and it's just. Do you not understand the amount of control over the economy they're actually positing would would require more than what Marxists would require for a communist revolution, and they're just not being honest about it. Like, exactly. Like, there's no way this will ever work if you don't have direct control over production. It, like, as soon as you do something like this, you're going to open up black markets. People are just going to find ways around this. It's not. It, it's not a serious policy solution to 
it's it's just wishful thinking that if you can combine all these different ideas to get exactly what you want. So <laughs> yeah, you have to target investment. You have to tax the shit out of people. You have to um, and and hope that that doesn't lead to 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 uh, political backlash, which it will. Um, you have to like. There's a reason, for example, that almost all Keynesians have effectively given up the primary inflation control that Keynes thought existed, which is taxation. Mm -hmm. There's a reason why they've given it up. And there's a yeah, and there's a reason why, for example, Ackerman and up not this has nothing to do with what you were arguing with him about, but in the past, he's like, Well, inflation is good for the working class. That was, you know, two years ago, that was like every article he was writing. Uh Um, and as long as it doesn't get above, like, what is it? Like 12% or something. And I'm like, only if you think the working class are debtors, which I don't like, there's a confusion of categories there. uh, My friend. Um, yeah, I mean, the middle class has way more debt than like the, I mean, middle class is nebulous, but like middle income earners, like these are, are much more likely to benefit than like people who are really just scraping by um with like wages and so on because you need yeah. ass- assets to have liabilities uh like large liabilities right uh, exactly you 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 have to have assets you have to have you you have to be there's a, there's a way in which people are playing around with i mean middle class is nebulous but like playing around with moving the image of the middle class worker and the working poor yeah. So that you so that you're not like always shuffling around who's being helped where. Um and I think this is a this is a pretty big problem. Um, because like I've said, I don't necessarily disagree with what MMTers have to say about money and currency. Mm-hmm. I disagree with them on what that means about production. And power relationships. And a a lot of what they're actually advocating for, if you think about it, requires a vast managerial class beyond even what the Soviet Union or China when it was trying full communism ever had. Mm -hmm. Um, targeted, Targeted technocratic fiscal and monetary policy. Um, and you even you need like new techniques for like coordinating production too that they don't talk about what those would be because like if you if you're doing price controls and stuff and also trying to stimulate investment through like extra government spending the primary way that it, like the industries shift like they're in like reallocate sectorally is through price changes if you take that away like there's going to be all kinds of messiness that you're not that people that you're not even anticipating right now and aren't dealing with conceptually. Absolutely. So this means that right now, it seems like the most connected um, part of the class to tie this back into your stuff. And then we'll get to talking about the fed and your current thesis Mm -hmm. about how that works, but that, the people most activated by this is the petite bourgeoisie, particularly the petite bourgeoisie and then what let's call the middle tier petite bourgeoisie yeah. who also tend to be tied into sunbelt production that are downwardly mobile as both individuals and a class um, who tax rates really are an existential threat to their profit rates and thus their ability to socially reproduce mm-hmm. um, in a way that they are not for everybody else. Um, I mean, w- let's be honest. Uh, while there's a ton of taxes that hit the poor, actual income tax doesn't that much. Um, mm-hmm. uh, and the poor, by definition, don't tend to have a whole lot of other profits to to go yeah. after. Um, and so they get hit by other things: hidden fees, um, service taxes like Medicare and Medicaid, uh, uh, Social Security. Um, but even those are, those are limited, you know, cause they're bracket cap. Um, whereas the petite bourgeois who make it like, you know, a hundred to $200,000 a year, uh, in there who are theoretically comfortable, 
Um, and yes, I, I, you're right that these people are about 60% GOP. Um, they are still probably a large part of the more conservative end of the, of the Democrat base, depending on if they're urban or not. I mean, here's the thing is that they're especially important for party politics because they're the people who can participate. They have like some kind of independent wealth. They have like the, they're the ones who are pulling things in regional and state parties, basically. Absolutely. Right. Basically. Yeah. If it, they for are both the parties, people, they are the people participating in municipal politics, which is the basis of politics, whether we like it or not. Mm-hmm. And no one else really has the time, the inclination or the ability, particularly now because of profitability rates, things like local media and whatnot are completely non-viable. I yep. mean, I like to, when people talk to me about this, I always remind them about my podcast. My podcast is profitable. I mean, I do have headway. I don't have a ton, but like it's profitable because my audience is all over the world. It is diffuse. So I, but if I tried to survive off of my local audience and be a local oriented Marxist entertainment mm-hmm. podcast or whatever handing out vhs tapes and- yeah or even even just like i'm just focusing on my local party here on the internet and that's all i want mm-hmm. i would not be viable there's no right. way right diffusion is how this kind of you know rentier quasi-capitalism works um now people should think about that across the board because it makes it look like we're able to build more than we, we can because you used to be able to support media apparatuses with staffs. Mm-hmm. All right. Off of local advertising. Yeah. That is not possible now. Um, which also means that you need more overhead to even have the knowledge base about local politics to participate in it meaningfully. Yep. I don't just mean running or giving to can like even knowing who the candidates are is harder than it used to be because people like me aren't covering them because there's no profit base for us to do so. Mm-hmm. And so when I hear that like there's no profitability problem, I'm like, then explain to me why the economy works the way it does right now, and you can't. Mm-hmm. Or or you'll say you you'll say, well, we're not doing the investment you know, correctly, this is actually what I get from MT is, you know, if we, if we focus, and I'm like, well, how do you focus that, that cleanly with what mechanism do you actually do planning only by, by, by monetary and fiscal policy that directly, you can't control that like that. Mm-hmm. Um, at, at what point is using this intermediary of money as a power lever, actually not that efficient. Um, you know, it's not to say that you can't, but there seems to be a bait and switch on the general. We print more money. We can stimulate stuff and the specific on how we coordinate, how we plan, how we'd stop, you know, how we'd manage the economy to deal with when it gets overheated and thus inflationary or whatever. Like all these things are questions that are theoretically addressed in the abstract kind of mm-hmm. and then dropped out. And that seems to be a left wing move. And I've always, it's always seemed to me to be a progressive move, but I've seen, quote, social democratic Marxists increasingly do it. Um, why do I say it's a progressive move? Because the progressive attitude has always been very similar to the Bernsteinian attitude, but even more vulgar in a lot of ways, that we could just regulate our way there. Right? Yeah. And for one... I don't mean to give conservatives much much heed, but that level of regulation is absurd. Like, yeah. I mean, it's one of the, like, I, I don't know. There's lots of, um, it, it, I think it's one reason that, like, you why you see that you, there is, like, this gap between, like, this, uh, you see the decline of the small businesses. They're, like, one to five people. And then all the other kind of businesses, like small, medium businesses, are, are increasing over most of like the the history that we have. Is that I mean regulation um, is like a real thing. Like people, 
I mean, I, I, I obviously have like a, an affection for a bureaucracy, um, but I obviously it, filling out forms and, and trying in red tape is annoying in general. Um, and the, the, the simplest way to like, the, the simplest way to accomplish lots, and some people talk about it, like, oh, we could ha start like a public company that does certain things, model it off after like post service or a different public corporations. Um, and that would be great. Uh, I, I think that, but I don't know, I think that the thing that a lot of people just don't, um, well, actually, let me rewind a bit because this actually relates to, um, like the deeper thing here, which is, and this is a problem that Marxists have as well in a much more sophisticated and twisted kind of form is that we don't really have very sophisticated theories of the state um, that this is anywhere in like um, across the political spectrum, I think. Because um, if you do, if you do have a good theory of the state of how like social institutions function and how they are, how they form and, uh, reproduce themselves, um, then you can start to answer some of these questions. Well, how do you do X? And, and some of these things are like trans-historical, you know, like you, you create social institutions to do these things. Um, but the, like the, the, the problem um, for everyone is that nobody really understands how those things are connected to um, economics, to the, like to um, not just capital, surplus but surplus in general how this how these things relate to um historical tendencies of like the state to form and what what its internal logics are um and unfortunately i think marxists have largely actually left that primarily yeah. to, to anarchist anthropologists frankly who are the only people who seem to talk about surplus in this way and i guess bataille like like you know but i, I actually agree we have to look at like trans historical uh tendencies we have to look at game theoretical outcomes like um as much as i and you disagree on altusser altusser it a, attempts a theory of the state i think his theory is nascent at best but at least he kind of has one marx avoids the question i mean he does he it is something that originally he planned on doing mm -hmm. um he never got there it, it is not worked out like um, and I think it, it does show up in so much that Marx has a theory of the state. It usually is implicated in his debates with either Blanquist on one side or anarchist, usually Bakutin anarchist or Perdona anarchist on the other, mm -hmm. um, where you get a nascent idea of what he means by like dictatorship of the proletariat, uh, a state to stateless society, um, you know, and Lenin does what he can to work that out. But again, at this point, I think we can all agree that those understandings, while there might not be anything wrong with them, they're not sufficient. They may be mm -hmm. necessary, but they're not sufficient in explaining what we see in the modern state. And, then we have to start dealing with counter institutions and you'll get, you'll get things like dual power. Well, fine, but how does dual power handle the scale difference today? Or you know what, you know, who is able to do dual power better than the working class right now, the petty bourgeoisie, because mm -hmm. they are more willing to be class collaborationist to maintain whatever vision of the status quo they have in their head. I but, mean, this is exactly like why I wrote that article in the petty bourgeois is that they, um, like I, 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 had, I was revisiting my priors of, uh, like of Marx because I, I realized like for the longest time I was still committed to the idea that we could um, reverse these tendencies of like atomization and somehow um, that like the recreation of monopoly capital will reestablish the tendencies that Marx identified of the socialization of labor, centralization. Um, the expropriation of capitalists by a smaller number of capitalists and so on. Um, but as, as I, as that's not happening again, this time because of petty bourgeois power, um, I was thinking, well, what does, 
let's go back to the drawing board here for a second. What like what is what is this problem here? Why why is why is like this was like something that has always been a thorn in my side that I, I I'm trying to address. It's like what how do we think about the petty bourgeois? Let's not just um, let's go back to the like the basics and uh, and try to figure this out. And, I, and unlike just what Marx was doing in Capital, trying to work this through a theory of the state. And what I realized is that if you like this thing that um, Althusser identifies this that I always come back to the relative maximization of violence or potential violence, depending on how you want to think about it, um, is like is this transhistorical tendency of the state of of how states not just like a particular state, but as states throughout history, because you can have states that actually fail to in the sense and they get destroyed usually. Um, and the reason that's important is because it's the same thing that, um, like Marx, like everybody identifies this in like the moments of defeat, you know, that Marx saw this after the failure of the, um, the second French revolution. And then Adorno and the, the Frankfurt school people are, are talking about, uh, the same kind of thing after World War II. Um, and, and like the... Uh, after post-Stalin secret speech stuff, um, is that when you see that, like the the history of like increasing, like a, a he talks about like from um, like throwing like the uh, I forget what the first thing was like a stone or something to the atom bomb, um, mm -hmm. the slingshot to the atom bomb. I think it was. Um, like this, this tendency to create more refined and powerful apparatuses of violence. Um, how do and, and Marx was Marx was actually kind of talking about the opposite, but he was talking about the increasing perfection of the state through the centralization um, of the French state um, and uh, through uh, the first revolution, the first Napoleon, and then the second revolution, the second Napoleon. Um, and these things are all connected, is what Althusser is saying. Is that uh, in his final critique of uh, Marx um, in, in trying to create this theory of the state, um, he's saying that the you have on the one hand these increasingly refined um, methods of social control and political power um, in the state in creating ideology and so on, and then also the more refined and powerful methods of actual violence, and this is connected to decrease the violence of all other actors on the one hand and increase the violence of the state. And when you realize that, and you think about this in an evolutionary framework of the state, the, the problem of the petty bourgeois makes a lot more sense because in order to get to like each of these things that happened when you had um, the failure of the, the 1848 revolutions and then you had um, what appeared to be like the, the, the failures of uh, Stalinist communism and then also like the hopes of uh, the second uh, international and so on. Um, like the, these things like were attached to like, well, first was like the failure of like um, uh, the bourgeoisie to create a, like a liberatory politics, right? Mm -hmm. And then it was like the failure of the proletariat or the first, the failure of the bourgeoisie, then the failure of the proletariat to create liberation and so on. Um, but these things, and I, I had this phrase in the, um, in the article that like everybody gets the unfreedom they deserve um, in the sense that like everybody's political actions to get their kind of, to get their freedom as a class is creates a particular kind of state that is um, capable of suppressing them mm -hmm. as like violent actors and so on. Um, and this is like what, this is what the revolutionary potential of the petty bourgeoisie is. Is it some is that at some point in this process of like once we see what the crisis of the petty bourgeoisie is, it's like it's going to be exist economically, but it'll have a political dimension that is equally important. Um, and when that happens, there is a crisis for the state as well that it has to adapt and overcome this somehow. Whether it's be through like, and this is talking about the state. It's like a species of social organization. So individual states may fail. Like the in, including like the the bourgeois state is a general category, um, 
what you have to, I think that you can't, if you can't escape these kind of tendencies in history, so long as like the state exists, you have to do like a meta analysis of how you respond to a crisis to get the outcomes that you want. And if you can't get like, um, if, if you know that the state is going to find a way to deal with this problem, you have to try to find the the solution out of all out of like the sample set of solutions that is most aligned with what you're interested in. That makes sense. Yeah, it makes sense to me. I mean, this is why I'm so interested in studying state formation, surplus formation, social institutions that arise out of surplus. And by surplus here, I don't mean like surplus capital, uh, you know, a la capital volume one through three. I mean, physical surplus general without even dealing with value categories. Mm -hmm. Like um, it's something that you have to look at and you have to start gaming out what's going to happen. What are the incentive structures? Uh, what kinds of social geographical, you know, interpersonal, intersocial factors lead to X. And if you can't do that, if mm -hmm. you don't have models for that beyond, you know, um, beyond very basic ones, you're going to be kind of at shit's Creek. Um, and it is actually to me, the problem of Bonapartism, which I admit for Marx was a post hoc adjustment to his theory. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, <laughs> it's very I, funny reading what he was hoping was going to happen at the start of the, the second French Revolution and then what actually happens. And he's responding to it in real time. Right. Yeah. And and I don't when I say it's post hoc, I'm not even here saying that it's necessarily bad. He's trying to concept reconceptualize what is going on mm -hmm. in real time as he's observing it. Um, from England, you know, uh, in journalism, in his polemics in the First International, etc. He was um, in France for the first part of it, and then, well, then, and then, uh, well, yeah, mm -hmm. by the time Bonaparte came to power, I think he was out. But yeah, it's uh, so, so I find this very, very interesting though, because this is where you start seeing something like a state theory. You start seeing the dealing with problem classes. So we have the yeah. two driving classes, but there's all these. Um, it's John Elster, not a guy I particularly like, but who did actually count the different class categories that show up in Marx. He counts 16 of them. Um, uh, and then if you take uh, what Clive Burrow says is the two distinctions between true lumpen and semi lumpen are, you know, lumpen so called, you know, which are categories he derives from the letters. Um, it reminds me of that uh, reporter like asking Biden how many genders are there, and he replies at least three. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> um, uh, you know, you, you get you get a ton coming out of out of this, and you have to. A lot of people have to like fix the categories in some way. I mean, Clyde Burrow, for example, says lump and proletariat was never meant to be a class. Well, Marx doesn't say that, although that is consistent with what Marx wrote because mm -hmm. the tradition, the, there's two theories of what causes people to be lumpen. Um, the first one is just the decayed social classes of prior social orders, which, okay, you can't explain all lump in this now with it. We're 150 years in capital that way. Mm -hmm. um, or 400 years independent of how you're counting. Um, or, or it's like people who are thrown into unclear positions in, in, in the work, you know, from, from all classes um, mm -hmm. and thus have to, parasite on this marx isn't consistent on it but he is working something out about state dependency because one thing that i think marx is today miss but is something that marx was very you know big on is like yes there has to be a seizure of the state but socialist and workers being dependent on the state before that seizure is actually a bad thing mm -hmm. it's not something marx wants um and his electoral strategy, both in the first international and in his advice to the SPD and letters is pretty clear. Like you don't, 
you don't fund a government you like you don't get in their way if they're helping workers but you don't you don't even take ownership of that because eventually it's going to be used for control and it's going to put you in a bad position you know, it's you're... funny because mm -hmm. i've been thinking about like what we, we were talking about the um the critique of the gotha program the other week mm -hmm. um or some while we we're talking ago. about it privately we still have to do that episode but yeah yeah um but what this is this is a very tangential thing about it is that he mentions in like i think it's one of the footnotes or something um or what are the after parts of it uh where he says that like the um they shouldn't support um like the abolition of like uh child labor um so like obviously like against like the excesses of it and so on but like that it's good for kids to have uh as like have experience working in things because it um gives them agency and and uh um like he actually like has his like uh ideas of like actualization and um independence of people and of working people you know um and i think that's consistent with what you were talking about um the like that it, it, like people talk today about like how um people uh, are, are are like so unprepared for uh, the real world now that like the way the education works the way that People going through college and, and so on. Um, like I, I've talked about how like the um, how universities and stuff operate as like a, a state ideological apparatus, um, and like in line with Alistair's there. Um, I think that in a lot of ways our society is um, like we, we've been dealing like the the way that capitalist states have adapted to like modern like because they're always creating these new hot fixes you know mm -hmm. it's like this is this too many this like this like it keeps accumulating and uh coming up with new um like every time you add something on it's you're not sure if it'll break something else you know like if you're trying to uh debug spaghetti code or something um and in a lot of the um, and this is, I think you can, like a lot of the evolutionary adaptations it has, like it, it cr came up with something to solve this particular crisis. And then it came up with this um, new thing to come up with, solve the next crisis and so on. Um, like it, the, the, like the, the colleges and stuff came for, for like very important in the, the 20th century to um, solve like the, the problems of the revolutionary proletariat, I think. Um well, it, it gets rid of a whole lot of people from the from the labor market. It also enables um, it divides the proletariat up and cartelizes things that you normally couldn't cartelize. Uh, it it also is a way for for the capitalist class to outsource and rent seek on training um, mm -hmm. and, and you know outsource that to the proletariat. You know, even a skilled, protected, cartelized labor aristocrat, labor aristocratic part of the proletariat itself. I mean, like, there's a ton of things it does. I mean, um, and I have been reading more and more of these sections of uh, of theories of surplus value in Capital Volume Three when Marx talks about like how pre-capitalist formations actually survive all the time in capital, but they change entire their social orientation changes what they do. Um, and I've been thinking a lot about that in regards to universities in regards to banking. He talks about this in regards to like usury, actually, he's like, he was talking about the, one of the, the change in functions of like, of a banking between late medieval and capitalist production, even though he's, you know, saying he's well aware that, that it was, you know banking's crucial for capitalism but it definitely existed for different reasons i mean i was going to get get to banking too here because it's it's one of these it's one of the places where we most clearly see like adaptations by the state to to these kind of crises well um, let's talk about that because because i think we've seen since 1981 mm -hmm. we've seen several radical but stealthy reorganizations of banking Right. Um, so let's talk about that because this is another article you were writing, but I think it's really important. 
Yeah. No, so like the in the eighties, like you, like one of the big things that happens is you have the savings and loan crisis. You have lots of centralization. Um, this paves the way for um, a lot of globalization that comes later because now you have like these really big banks that are the the sponsors, the creators of these new very liquid international markets of uh, different assets of of like state um, uh, bonds and equities and all these international companies and so on, uh, derivatives markets, forex, so on. Um, all of that, all the big international supply chains needed this to exist. Um, mm -hmm. What you have, and then you have like the 08 crisis, radically reorganized banking. Uh, you had QE and and, and so on. Um, like a lot of uh, it, interesting, like. Um, little hangovers like it's very interesting like the, the current situation we're in right now the reason like the thing i wrote that article um to highlight what was going on was because nobody who caused it to happen in in like oh wait seemed to think about this as a consequence because it it like the whole framework um that they were operating in never would have this never would have even happened and it didn't happen for a long time because they were everybody was so worried about um, liquidity and like the like the super low interest rates after uh, the Great Recession that lasted for so long um, that like nobody see, thought to think about well like because what happened in an 08 is that you had a transition away from um, controlling um, banks. Uh, like the the lending of banks and their interest rates, controlling like the, the the safest interest rate that they had by basically buying and selling treasuries and altering their reserves through that. It was kind of a, a funky like way of doing it, but that's what they did. Um, so you weren't the the Fed really wasn't it, it, there was a there were certain small situations where they were doing like repo repos and stuff and they were paying banks directly um but overall that wasn't the case after 08 they started um they changed it so that the lowest the or the, the safest interest rate that banks had was the interest rate they paid on they got paid on their reserves um that they put at the the federal reserve so the federal reserve basically has bank accounts for all of the major banks and the interest rate that they give those banks is basically the interest rate for the, like the is the fed funds rate the, for the overall economy um and how they this is how they manipulate interest rates now and because of that when you have rising interest rates you can have a situation where um the fed is actually paying a lot of money directly to these banks right well, what I found interesting about your argument there is it sounds like it's similar to what uh, Warren Mosler would argue that the that the payouts on the interest rates are holding up the entire economy. That's not what you're arguing, and I want to make that clear. Um, Mosler is basically arguing that's why we don't have a an unemployment crisis is the backdoor payouts on these interest rates. But I'm like, that only goes to banks. It doesn't necessarily go to places to give out payroll. So I don't yeah, know if exactly. that's actually true, but there is a sense in which the banks are being supported by the payouts on these interest rates. Um, yeah. I did the math that like, if you look at, if you take away those interest rates right mm -hmm. now, um, they would be making it would all like most of the big banks would be in negative profitability territory and the ones that aren't would be pretty close. Um, the, if, if they had like, this is a particular consequence of this particular um, economic policy or monetary policy framework. Um, it didn't have to be this way, but I, and while I don't know how, like what the exact, like um, what a different path would look like. Um, it's certainly the case that like the, these interest payouts to banks probably did help a lot in um, preventing like the spread of the um, uh, the Silicon Valley Bank uh, collapse. And, and so, yeah, we didn't have a we didn't have a crypto induced savings and loans crisis, basically. Yeah, exactly. I mean, there's still really big problems for banks right now because um, because interest rates are so high. 
a lot of the assets that they're holding are worth way less than what they paid for them. And if they tried to sell them, they would have big losses on their uh, on their statements. Um, they're not selling them, but they are. And if it came to that, the Fed would probably just buy them for them at higher prices to make sure that everything held together. Um, but that would be a whole other kind of thing, like the, that the, the Fed is all fixing these prices to, um, or, or in this hypothetical situation would be fixing prices to ensure the stability of the financial markets. So, like the whole thing calls into question, why do we need these guys? Uh, why do we need these big banks? Why does public monetary policy have to make private investors really wealthy? Like the owners of these banks, you know, mm-hmm. it, it's just really absurd that, that that's how it continues to work. Well, it, it does seem interesting to me that it, right. It, like QE seems to have been a way to get rid of toxic assets, just removing risk from the market and pumping asset uh, values. Not by like, I, I agree with the m It wasn't by like directly throwing money at the economy. It was by basically moving balance sheets around and creating asset protection for things that would otherwise have blown up. Um, like, like think of them as little asset bomb shelters. But they quit doing that because of inflation, and it makes sense because eventually you, you can't pump assets forever and it not eventually for some kind of exogenous shock flow out into the market. Like mm-hmm. eventually it's going to have to. Something, I don't know, COVID, whatever, could, can cause that to happen. Oil crisis, there's a number, a war, all kinds of things that are happening right now. Um, could cause that to happen. I mean, it's a really interesting. Uh, there's a really interesting um, dichotomy here, though, because oh, going back to the profit rates for a second, is that um, the uh, there's a funny dynamic when you have rising asset prices, right? Mm-hmm. Because when, like, if you um, are like, it's it's not boosting the income to the capitalist class as a whole, except to the extent to which. Um, there are non-capitalist asset holders who are um, like like losing money relative to them. Um, it's that like this is basically a thing that helps um, like older capitalists in the market, the ones who already have assets. If you're a capitalist going into the market as a newcomer and you're having to um, like you're having to pay relatively a lot to get access into this. And now your assets will be more worth more down the line. Probably that's actually like this. Obviously there's no guarantee. Right. Um, but the, 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 the actual returns that you're getting on these things um, is like, like the income that you're getting out of it. Like this, I mean, it's just a funny game that you play when it's when with asset inflation, right? Because, um, in order for there to be like someone who gains off of it, there has to be a seller and a buyer, you know, um, somebody has to be uh, losing money off of, uh, off of this in order for it to work. Um, like the, I mean, obviously like the, it, is if you try to get off this treadmill, if you of like, uh, of, of like increasing assets and try to actually consume a lot of that wealth, it would, a lot of it, it becomes like, fictitious it, it, the yeah. moment you try to actually valorize it. Exactly. I mean, see, see what like, and I admit, you know, there's a lot of pushback from uh, MMTers about the idea of fictitious capital. But my, my, the way I just say is, look, if your balance sheet says one thing, and when you go to try to sell it, most of that doesn't exist because mm-hmm. your valuation was inaccurate to when you were valorizing the capital. Then that was fictitious. It never existed. Like, right. But you the- can only know it though when you sell shit. So. Mm-hmm. But the thing is with like um, profit rates is that even though there's lots of money being made in these financial markets, the actual like, so it counts like the asset inflation in terms of rates of return, but the actual money that you can take out of the market is actually going down as a rate of like the, which is like reflected in interest rates on bonds, on dividends, on stocks and so on. Um, Like the, the, if you think about a rate of like um, the income return on uh, on an investment, excluding um, the 
asset price because you if you just roll it out imagine you like rolling it over indefinitely right um the actual income that you're getting out of it is going to be decreasing over time with this kind of asset inflation because the income is still determined by like what what these companies are making um where um so you can have weird scenarios where like this like these huge speculative energy is going on in stock markets and so on. Um, and the um, this so a lot of people are throwing their money away at it. The actual money in the economy is still in all these really big firms that do all the productive things, but they don't actually, like if you're a capitalist that's buying the stocks in that company, you have to pay a really high price for those. You know, you're, you're in order to get like whatever, like the, that makes it so that the dividends are, um, it's like socially adjusted return of, of like, uh, like 5% or whatever, you know, whatever beats inflation. Yeah. Yeah. I it, mean, it, it's, it's a, it's a socially determined thing. It's why like, it's why it's, it's actually a reason why for a long time people thought like that the equalization of profit where H was absolute because it is absolute, um, absolutely equal on the financial level. Uh, because it's totally liquid like that and, and so on. But on actual returns of companies and so on, it's not. Um, uh, well, yeah, I, I think this, however, makes it very clear, one, why the stakes around the state seem so high for both the petty bourgeoisie, for the PMS, uh, uh, for all these groups that are these like quasi-categories um, right now. Um why there's such an incentive to turn even things that traditionally are workers into pseudo contractors, uh, peace, peace workers in a way that, that offsets losses. Um, and why we see label struggles. I mean, one of the things about current temporary labor structures with the exception of the UAW is a lot of what you're seeing right now is, battles over small businesses their franchises are their small corporates i mean mm -hmm. but they're small businesses effectively and it's hard to deal with that that's why they don't often get good contracts or whatever because they can't really shut production down except that one site mm -hmm. and when you add all that together it, it we're in a very interesting time period because it seems like one you're right the petite bourgeoisie seem to dominate politics right now because they can participate Two, you have a radicalized, uh, broadly speaking, semi-skilled working class uh, that that has a lot of labor power right now. I mean, not a lot of a lot of market power. Excuse me, not labor power on the labor market. I mean, it always has labor power. That's what yeah. defines it. Um, but it has a lot of market power in the labor market because of a decline in the workforce, like in very simple terms. Um, and while adjustments in the economy uh, have have made that decline less, you know, less of a problem, um, they're also trying to up worker productivity rates, which were super high in like the aughts, but have been down now for like fifteen years. Mm -hmm. um, they they hit a peak, I think, around two thousand and five, um, and pushing people towards that right now is about pushing people beyond because the technical capacity with the exception of help with AI, which does has done some work reduction really is still not there for a whole lot of the labor market and you're just breaking the workers. So you're going to get more and more militancy that way, but they don't interestingly have properly speaking, political representation. When we see what the Democrats actually do, yes, they're kinder to labor in a lot of ways and in, in the ways Biden was like reform the, the, the National Labor Relations Board, et cetera. Um, but that's mostly through executive fiat that hasn't been through legislative action. Mm -hmm. And it's limited to a fairly small set of workers when you actually look who's covered by the Labor Relations Board. It's, you know, it's a subset of a subset of workers. You know, when you figure out that most workers aren't, aren't, aren't in unions, but most union workers actually are exempted from the, for the NCLB in some way. I mean, all state employees, for example, are, um, it, it, it becomes very clear 
that there's a real big limit to what's going on there. And what's still driving things is trying to keep the petite bourgeoisie at bay. And it doesn't seem to, and I'm going to be frank here, both parties seem to be having massive political crises right now on how to handle it and increasingly investing into Bonaparte's figures because they're elect, their entire political machine mm -hmm. uh, in the legislative branches at the state level, et cetera, seems to be breaking down. Um, yeah. um, I mean, that's, I mean, that, that's the thing about the, like why I brought up the atomization of this class that they like, they, all of the social tech, like this, some, there is some overlap in the social technologies that were created to deal with uh, both the workers and the high bourgeoisie and whatever, but it's not, but they, there's not a particular social technology built to deal with this of how to, um, like the, the bourgeois state was supposed to have moved beyond Bonaparte, you know, it's supposed yeah, to that have was developed... a whole at post post world war two post war state is supposed to be to get us beyond this problem. Yeah, exactly. But you, but because of the way that the petty bourgeois works is uh, because of their atomization, because they can't like you, you can't use these institutions um, to control them if they don't participate in them. You know, like they participate in the like the, the state and the parties and stuff, but they're not like in terms of like the universities, the media, the um, like they're creating all of these counter like media networks and stuff uh, because they don't because they're not um, being uh, directly connected into these existing networks and institutions. Um, they, they haven't developed a set of like uh, policy tools and, um, and uh, structures to deal with them. Basically uh, all they can do is disrupt, but they yeah. can disrupt. And that's the thing that I think, which makes them a political actor because it can gum up the machine. But what is the petite bourgeois political vision? other than trying to maintain something about the status quo, it's not even consistent amongst the class because it can't be different parts of petite bourgeois are going to need different things. And that leads to a kind of incoherence that can only be papered over by administrative fiat, but that's only viable for so long. I mean, like, here's the thing. Here's like the ultimate solution that you have come to. And it comes, and it's related to the disagreements that I've, uh, that I kind of have with Brenner himself and but also Ackerman um, mm -hmm. that like the, there's a lot of the discussions recently have been about the connection between growth rates and profit rates. Mm -hmm. And on a cyclical level, we know that there is a very close connection because um, like, you know, if you have more sales, you generally have more profits and um, there's a bunch of other reasons for this as well. Um like he also from the, like the classical price mechanism and so on that um, more higher profit rates are going to generally lead to higher real output um, because people see that there's money to be made and creating commodities and so on. But on a secular level, there's no reason to expect um, that there is a particular connection between a one profit rate for society and one like average growth rate um, because you can, because um, it goes back to the Kalecki profit equations. In other words, it goes back to basic accounting. Like the, uh, the profits of society are always going to be equal um, in like the aggregate to uh, the amount of investing and the amount of consumption of the capitalist class. And you can have that technically with any growth rate. Um, like you could, you could, and we can imagine like, um, but obviously there are social institutional reasons why it's correlated with certain profit rates. Um, like if, if we have a society where we are firmly taking a big share of the pie and just giving it to capitalists, um, just because they're capitalists, because of the, it is now just an enshrined property relationship in the state that these people get this share of income or whatever, um, that, that's not necessarily going to be good for growth it is like how, but it is a way to preserve um, bourgeois social relations through rentierism. Um, it's a, and this is what I've been saying since from the very beginnings, I've been talking about like the petty bourgeois that um, 
they can, the one way out of this is to create a society where like they, like the profit rates are no longer a thing, which is like an economic mechanism of, uh, of exchange and coordination of investment and so on. They have to neuter it in order for them to maintain their um, social relations and their, their status in society. Well, that does seem to leave us in quite a bind, honestly. And it leaves, I think it leaves Marxists in a particularly precarious place because on one hand, we actually have the beginnings of a theory to understand the economic apparatus of which this works. But we have not been or are afraid to develop a, a, a theory of the state that does not see just use the state as our as something we can seize and use as a method for our own control, like which I think mm -hmm. is like, yeah, sure, that's a goal, but that doesn't explain anything about what's going on right now or your own role in it. And that's my challenge yeah. to people like Ackerman and Brennan and Riley. I was also dissatisfied with the Brennan Riley thesis as I've, I've responded mm -hmm. to it elsewhere. Um, I thought there was insight in it, like you know, uh, I I, I I stick by the phrase, the irony of political capitalism is it's basically Keynesianism that doesn't work. Like, <laughs> like Because uh, yeah. the whole fucking point of Keynesianism is to restore profitability by, by acting counter cyclically. And this clearly doesn't do that. So mm -hmm. it, um, uh, and not in a, not, not seemingly in a long-term sustainable way. And when we start adding the number of exogenous shocks to use, you know, contemporary political uh, economic language, by that I mean wars, uh, climate crises, etc., we really need a more robust theory for the for this stuff because there's a lot of stuff flying at us at once, and we're seeing old forms come back again. And I think, uh, you know, to kind of end this off at. I, I've been thinking about the last bits of writing by Mac Davis, you know, uh, um, uh, his the the Enigmas book, his last book, plus his very last piece of writing, you know, Thanatos. Uh, I'm not familiar. Well, he he basically argues that like um, that you're seeing Bonapartism uh, and the decline of collective rule everywhere. Uh, I mean, he even says it in China. Um, and that it's making the entire political system more fragile. And um, he basically seemed very worried, you know, about the future as he was dying, um, about where the left was going to be able to handle this problem of um, the, de the degrading of institutions, since we're also wedded to these institutions and don't seem to be able to figure out ways to be both counter systemic and productive of a new kind of politics mm -hmm. uh the petite bourgeoisie as you said can be counter systemic but it doesn't build anything with that counter system it, it can't yep. it is not in the position to, even if they wanted to even if there was a concrete vision they're not in a position to do that they're too dependent on the current mechanisms of power mm -hmm. um which is the irony of uh, at least the irony of of your thing they're creating the very state that is crushing them, but they're the people creating it actually. Yeah. Like um, from everything from the ability of the state to do censorship, like ironically, the ability to outsource so much of, uh, you know, for the state to start muddling around and, and private corporations, which it's always done, frankly, mm -hmm. to achieve in through censorship to get around, you know, censorship blocks that exist in constitutionally in the United States you know, quasi constitutionally in Europe, although they're much weaker. Um, that that's ironically been created by their own imperatives, yep. right? That's what did that. Um, and their response to that being used against them is to create new imperatives that will be used against them, but it doesn't create any new politics and it can't. But the left right now seems to be totally divided on whether or not we're tailing the seeming counter systemicness of this petite bourgeois vision or the progressive vision of a certain strata of professionals and capitalists who like, you know, large capital, basically, who have progressive social norms because it's good for 
for growing markets, frankly, um, but do not necessarily have any vision beyond that. Um, and we just seem to be stuck there mm -hmm. in, in a kind of impasse between these two forces. And on, even though at a time where it does look like there's real, real working class militancy, and yet despite the left being bigger and having being revitalized as a force during the aught teens, not seeming to be able to do anything about that. Mm -hmm. You know, that seems to be where we're at. And I do think a lot of it comes from, frankly, pushing economic just so stories to get out of the hard part of this problem. Cause this is a hard yeah. problem. Um, because let's say we do have a final crisis right now. All right. Let's say that actually exists. We have a true, we have a true profitability crisis worldwide. That would do it. Right. And it actually happens. Um, right now, the reactionary forces would be in a much better advantage to take oh, yeah. into, into some other form of barbarism than anything we want. Like, no, uh, nobody's really prepared for it again. Like, nobody was prepared for it the first time. And nobody's really talking about the possibility of it happening again. Um, and nobody is prepared to, like, really deal with uh, the petty bourgeois either. Um, I, I, yeah, and I feel like we get outflanked by people like Michael Lind. Mm -hmm. Like, like... You know, I had, a, like, a, a very pessimistic optimist. Like, oh, maybe you could tail the high bourgeoisie a bit to try to see if they'll do something about this because it's a, a, a threat to their interests, kind of. Um, but they didn't seem interested in doing very much at all. Um, like, it's nobody... They don't seem like, interested in even, fight, as you said, to bring it all the way back to the beginning of the show. They don't even seem interested in fighting antitrust legislation uh, yeah. enforcement. Like... Which is insane, kind of. But <laughs> I, mean, I mean, they'll they'll lobby against it, They'll, but they won't... They have no sense of like. This is the other thing is that I think that the like the this is something I didn't understand when I was younger, but I think I understand now that like it, it wasn't just like the the state like figuring out how to deal with the proletariat. It also figured out how to deal with the high bourgeoisie, and that's what like the first like what that's what the original bourgeois revolutions were. The high bourgeoisie got the unfreedom they deserved. And this is what the, the result is. They don't have any, like, there there is no high bourgeois political vision, and there hasn't been for over 100 years, um, because they, like, the, they fixed that. <laughs> it's done. Um, so they, they have no reason to deal with this except through the most mundane legal means that may go nowhere. Yeah, I mean... In some ways, this brings me back to a piece by Stephen Bertram Lee a while back where he says, look, it looks like the bourgeoisie no longer has the capacity to do, to actually perform its historic roles. And thus, um, uh, it does seem stuck. I mean, you know, I, I hear the platypoid screaming regression and maybe they're right. I, I don't know that, that framing it that way is necessarily helpful. Um, mm -hmm. But there does seem to be a real impasse here. And, um, well, this is what I was trying to get at earlier, which was that the, all these things are ways for, um, society to, uh, better reproduce the relations of production. But you, but at a certain point, if you keep getting better and better at that, you can't also forget just reproducing production. And if you do create an adaptation that interferes with that somehow, then you've got a big problem. And that's what the whole thing with the fetters of production are, that it's related to that. If, that like the, All of these adaptations that capitalism has done has been to, um, in order to preserve the, the bourgeoisie, have basically prevented, have created a limit on what it can, on its productive capacity, on what... Uh, on how it can grow its productive capacity, essentially. Um, and this is the other argument I made in, in the, the Petty Bourgeois article, um, that if, and this is a big if, of course, but if there was an alternative system that worked anywhere in the world, it would be an existential threat to bourgeois society. Um, any, any place that could overcome this problem by 
just wiping the slate clean and not having to deal with these social classes would be um, and have, you know, like a set of institutions that actually did uh, reproduce itself effectively without like the same kind of problems that the Soviet Union did. Um, it would overcome capitalism. It would be um, like it. Like it, it would be a more I, I use the word metastable solution. Yeah. But of course, how do you get there? You know, yeah. how it's it's like it, it it's like, yeah, if 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 there was a um like uh it's like all the fuel spent. Yes, if you could light another fire, it, it would burn much brighter, or whatever, but or I, I don't know, it, it's it's just, it's the fundamental problem that you can't get around of how do you create an alternative? Yeah, it's a, uh, it is a depressing problem to think about, but it's something that if socialist, if socialist is going to mean anything in the 21st century, given the quote poly crises that we are dealing with right now, um, this is a challenge that we have to ask. Otherwise, we're going to be outflanked by by an incoherent petite bourgeois force that also can't really even get its own means achieved. And yeah. right now, we are clearly being outflanked. And in fact, I would argue, a good portion of us have helped them. Yeah, yeah. Like, you know, that... Well, it's, it's crazy because both both sides, like all sides are basically doing this. Everybody's... Like the right is telling the petty bourgeoisie, the left is oh, a big portion of the left is telling the petty bourgeoisie those that aren't aren't really doing much of anything besides being a part of the existing state apparatus. Right. Um, there is no like, I, I mean, I admire a cosmonaut for what they're trying to do, but it's like there is no like specific anti-systemic um, uh, left force that has like a, a, a specific uh, it's connected a, a geo, a uh, basis. right that has a real political economic answer to these questions some of them have geopolitical mm -hmm. uh analyses and fine i mean some of that you know whether i don't agree with a lot of it i agree with a lot of it sometimes it depends but without a political economic basis that doesn't actually mean that much um and by what by that i mean understanding not just currency flows, like having a pretty robust understanding of class, mm -hmm. of social reproduction, of the way this is even affecting, like the way people organize themselves, the way people have relationships. It, it, it goes down the scale uh, and also the way the state is organizing. So it, like, like those two things have to be kind of viewed. And I just think we, we have a very naive view of the state right now. Um, mm -hmm. It tends to be either simplistically anarchistic about, you know, the state is violence, which, okay, true, but also not particularly helpful about how to deal with it. Um, uh, or it, it sees the state as a lever, which we can, can cleanly pull. I, I think that's what Ackerman's variety of socialism ultimately is right now. Um and it doesn't see how these counterfactuals are in better places to use that lever uh, um, and how decayed all the other major social forces are. And mm -hmm. yet we, despite militancy, can't seem to do much about it. Like we can't like you would think at this moment, this would be the moment for the beginnings of the mergers to get the left and the labor movement back together. And yet right now that feels really far apart. Like, yeah. Um. Well, thank you, Nico, for that depressing conversation. I'm going to put the list uh, of your articles. Most of these are available at the Prehistory of the Encounter, uh, which is your Substack. Um, all the articles that we mentioned are fully available for free. So while you should subscribe, you don't have to to get this information. You can go read Nico's work here. Um, you provide a lot of a lot of your articles are free on that site. So yeah, I only <laughs> I only marked one as paid, and then I kind of gave up on marking things as paid because I every time I think, oh, but I want people to read it. So I'll, yeah. <laughs> um. So uh. So yeah, you can you can help support Nico learn how to be a better petit bourgeois himself since he's clearly not good at it. Um, 
<laughs> the worst petty bourgeois that ever lived. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> um, and on that note, thank you so much. People should check out. Do you have anything else you'd like to plug? Nah, that's it. All right. Thank <laughs> you.